So I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to do a little bit of interaction today and, and I'll just give you an overview of some of the stuff that I've been playing with for quite a few years now. Um, and the beauty of mobile is that it changes, it changes really rapidly. So uh, it's, it's hard to get bored if you're interested in mobile learning. So I'm just going to flick over here. So I want you to think of what's, what's the point of this video. So what's the takeaway? <laughs> beans. Beans. <laughs> beans. I wasn't sure if you would have seen this before because apparently Heinz is pretty popular in the UK, but uh, in New Zealand we have Watties, which is our local uh, sort of manufacturer. Any ideas? What, what's the what's the point of the video? Short and sharp. Short and sharp. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Baked beans, not for astronauts. Uh, so I, I guess I'm just sort of extrapolating from that that um, mobile learning may not be suitable for every occasion either. So sometimes I, I guess you find a tool and you try to use it for everything. Um, but it's, it's about thinking creatively and critiquing, is this appropriate for what you're trying to do? Is it appropriate for that context? Uh, is getting people to write an essay on their iPhone an appropriate activity to do? Probably not, because it's easier to do on a laptop. So it's thinking about what is appropriate and uh, you know, as beans aren't appropriate for astronauts, the same thing with mobile learning. So I'm just going to get connected here. Okay, and someone's tweeting, which is good. Right, so it's just a little bit easier if we can be wireless and move around, which is obviously you know, reasons why we've got mobile devices rather than having to be connected. How many people have been to New Zealand? Two. How many people know where it is? <laughs> okay, most of you. Which is um, you know, a bit normal for the UK. It's a little bit abnormal for uh, people from the US or Europe normally, but... Uh, Anyway, I wanted to just give you a little bit of an overview of, of where I've come from, just to give you a little bit of context. Um, so this is linked on that Evernote. So the Evernote is just a whole lot of collection of stuff. And we'll probably get through some of that today. We'll get through some of it uh, later in the week. And if there's something that you're really interested in, hopefully there's something there for you about mobile learning. So this is a Google Tour Builder. I don't know if anyone's come across Google Tour Builder. It's one of their beta tools. Uh, and what I'm doing here is opening up the, the tour that I've created in Google Earth. And let's see if we can actually just, because uh, I previewed it before, it's actually gone through and taken me right to the end point, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, so, What I did was created this sort of virtual tour showing me where I'd come from, from New Zealand, etc. So if I just go, where's home? Oh, it's not, uh, not taking me there right now. I think it's because I've turned on the, uh, the location services. But what you can do with Tour Builder is you can actually link between places. And so what, uh, if you click on the, the link on your laptop, it'll show you going through various places. Um, 
and it takes me from Auckland to Brisbane, then from Brisbane to Manchester, uh, then from Manchester I took the train to, um, well, you know, Piccadilly, and I was in Manchester for a week at a conference, and then took the train down to Coventry. So the tour actually takes you through that, but unfortunately it's just not doing that right now for me, which is a pain. But you can click that link for yourself. So I want to flick back to the iPad. So I'm just going to get the iPad connected here. Sounds like we've got some, uh, maybe some latecomers. Okay, well, welcome. Um, I think one of the keys for me about mobile learning, as I sort of said at the start, is about thinking differently. Uh, this is a photo of a young guy at uh, Sydney Central train station. I took it a few years ago. The devices should sort of give you an idea of the, the sort of date that I took the photo. Any sort of idea? I'll zoom in a bit, maybe. You can come in. What what devices has he got? Any ideas? He's got a palm. Yep. Yes, he's got a uh, projecting keyboard. So it's a little battery. It's Bluetooth. So that's linked to his um, palm PDA. And what he's doing is composing an email. Um, this is 2007. Okay, so it's a fair while ago, but uh, this is a guy just using a whole mo multiple load of devices, Bluetoothing to his keyboard, it's virtual keyboard, that's why his fingers are pink because it's projecting onto the table, it's sensing where his fingers are, and then inputting that back to his PDA, and his PDA, because it wasn't in, that, in those days uh, a cell phone, is then linked via Bluetooth to his actual Palm cell phone, and he was using that to upload. And there's one more device that you probably didn't see, um, he, he had an iPhone, um, I iPod Touch, um, and you can see the earbuds there, which he took out because I was talking to him, which uh, when I came up to him, he had them in while he was you know, multitasking. And the last thing that he's got there is his, his slushy drinking away. Um, so I th just thought it was a really interesting photo. Uh, this is kind of, I suppose, sort of where I started with mobile learning was with palms, and palm PDAs, uh, with the handwriting, touch recognition, etc. Um, but Palm basically exploded, and after about, pretty soon after this photo, uh, Palm basically disappeared, really. And uh, of course, in 2008, um, the iPhone came out, and it changed the whole world, really, as far as mobile learning goes. So QR codes. Well, I guess they're one of the, the easiest things that you can do with um, camera phones, smartphones, etc. Um, and people use them in different creative ways. So this is a huge one on a billboard trying to get people's attention for an actual campaign. Uh, this is America. And of course the first thing you have to do is actually scan it, get to decode it to find out what it's trying to say. So it's sort of an element of mystery. You can sort of make it a bit of a game type of thing. Maybe it's sort of a hide and seek or, or we've done things like um, uh, get students to actually create um, a, a joke of the day put it into a QR code, paste it on the door, and the only way, way that you can tell what that is is by decoding it. Hopefully it's nothing rude. <laughs> so of course getting people interacting and doing stuff and scanning um, actually gets them out of their seat and uh, hopefully starts to change some of the collaboration in the classroom. So reasons for doing this sort of stuff, well this is from Eric Mazur. I don't know if anyone's heard of Eric Mazur. He's uh, um, mainly a mathematician, teaches maths. And uh, after years of lecturing, he um, decided uh, that he wanted to improve his lecturing technique and he got some of his students to do this uh, research where what they did was they got several people and put electrodes on their, on their heads and monitored their brainwave activity over a week uh, doing different activities. 
and uh, you can see the results of that brainwave activity for different types of activities. The interesting thing is, as far as class goes, what's the closest to being in class? Any ideas? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're actually far more engaged while they're asleep than they were in class. Um, the closest to being in class was TV, watching TV, which is a completely passive experience. So uh, his takeaway from that was, well, you know, being in, being in a big lecture and uh, people basically going to sleep on you is, is perhaps not the best uh, learning style. Um, but what he did find was that the brainwave activity went up hugely as soon as he introduced some interactivity into the learning experience. Started asking questions, getting people working in groups, doing stuff in the class rather than just sitting there and listening. And that's what you can do with mobile devices in particular because everyone's got them, is that you can actually do some interactive stuff. So. This is some stats from last year from the International Telecom uh, Telecommunications Union. Um, so I haven't updated this, but uh, as you see, basically everyone in the world has a mobile device. Um, in fact, there's more, according to this, by the end of 2014, uh, which has been, there's going to be more cell phones on the planet than people. So we're already there. Uh, and um, the biggest growth is in the, the poorest countries, it's, it's huge. Another important uh, fact, this is from John Landis, who was one of the Apple uh, distinguished sort of educators who went around the world, um, showing that there's b basically a, a turning point as far as technology goes in 2013. He sort of likened it to the printing press, the invention of the printing press, where books went from you know, stuck in monasteries and people having to hand copy them to once the printing press was invented, everyone had access to books. And it's a bit like uh, the mobile phone. Suddenly, everyone has access to the internet. So in 2013, internet connections on mobile phones exceeded internet connections on desktops and laptops combined. So for a majority of people, their first connection, particularly in developing countries, uh, is not through a computer, it's through that tiny computer they have in their pocket, which is a which is a cell phone, and increasingly smartphones. So one of my uh, heroes, I suppose, about thinking differently is Steve Jobs, um, who obviously was the Apple founder and, and uh, brought about a whole lot of range of new devices. Great to see you've got a latest MacBook. I'm jealous. Um, I tried to get one off my uh, my um, HOD, but it, he wouldn't anyway. Um, <laughs> So thinking differently, uh, I just like this photo, it's pretty cool and there's been a huge sort of internet meme go around this, a uh, big story about it and I've got a link there if you want to check out about the, the story behind this photo. Um, but I've got grandkids so I just think it's quite a cool photo. And uh, this is from my childhood, this, my, my dad took this photo in the 60s and uh, this is what should happen to all caravans. <laughs> uh, and this is a photo uh, that I took for my wife because my wife's a vegetarian and uh, we were had parked car outside uh, the Mad Butcher. The Mad Butcher is a butcher chain in New Zealand. And uh, this is the Mad Butcher bringing his uh, pork in. That was just to aggravate my wife. Uh, and this guy here obviously thinks differently about his beard. He's quite happy about it too. So uh, I did ask him if I could take his photo. <coughs> and um, I don't show that photo to my wife because she wants me to grow a long beard. Um, I'm into cycling. This guy likes thinking differently about his bike. As you can see, he likes being seen. It's all fluorescent orange, as, and there's many lights as he can fit on there. <laughs> yeah, possibly. And uh, this is my favourite bike. It's a Cannondale. Uh, it's all carbon fibre and it folds up. Uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, great for a commuting bike. Unfortunately, I'll never be able to afford it. It's about 30,000 New Zealand dollars. So i just give you a bit of context about myself, because um, none of you actually know who I am. Uh, this, is, this is me back in the 80s. There you go. I used to have hair, and uh, it used to be ginger. So I played in bands. So I guess the context that I come from is, is music. And um, I taught audio engineering and music production. My first job was designing loudspeakers, uh, which is unfortunately why I'm half deaf in one ear, because Playing in bands plus feedback don't go together. Uh, and um, 
This is from the 90s when we were trying to be rock stars in New Zealand. And uh, I just like that so I can prove to my kids that I used to have here. <laughs> so this is me teaching. So this is um, about 99, I think, or 2000. can't remember exactly. Uh, and we were a small polytech in New Zealand, the smallest, second smallest polytech in the country, teaching music and audio engineering, which is all completely computer-based by that time. We did have a tape machine, but no one used it. It's all on computer software. Uh, and because we're such a small polytech, we couldn't afford to have huge computer labs for students to be able to do this sort of stuff. So we came up with the idea of, well, how about the students actually uh, buy their own, bring their own device? And so what we did was we doubled the fees and uh, for the price of our main competitor, which is SAE. I don't know if you have a School of Audio Engineering here. It's big in Australia and in America. Um, they're a private um, provider. Uh, they charge $9,000 a year for fees. We charge four, four and a half thousand dollars. And so we doubled our fees to $9,000 and all our students got a laptop. So not only did they get a better course, in our opinion, they also got a laptop. And of course, over the period of time, the cost of that laptop went down and down every year. So each year, we just bundled more into that package. So they got a bundle of software, headphones, et cetera, et cetera, each year. Um, this is, I guess, my experience of what I come from was that I wanted all my students to have a device, we provided the network, and then we interacted with that device in class live. So we'd do stuff on the net. Um, initially, we shared a dial-up connection and had the first, uh, first airport, the Apple airport uh, Wi-Fi device. And then eventually we got broadband, which was a whole lot faster. And you can see they're all hopefully engaged in what they were learning. So moving on a few years, um, I became an academic advisor. I work with other lecturers now rather than actually teach students directly myself. And we've done a lot of projects with students, in this case contemporary music, and we gave them all iPads and explored what they could do with iPads. So this is when the iPad first came out, about 2010, uh, which is huge for music now. The, the, the stuff that you can do on the iPad because it's multi-touch, you can simulate real instruments like keyboards. Uh, you know, it's much harder to do that with a mouse and a keyboard. It's just not intuitive for a musician, but moving your fingers on, on here and simulating a real instrument is, is really powerful. And particularly on the iPad rather than uh, perhaps Android tablets, the, the depth, the integration of the software means that you can get these fantastic, basically desktop level uh, music packages for less than a tenth of the price on an iPad. So an app that would basically cost you $500 on, on your desktop or your laptop might cost you five bucks on the iPad, has the same functionality, the same sound. So the entry level to uh, this technology has, has dropped a lot as well. Um, plus it's a whole lot more mobile. Students working you know, just in the corridor, wherever there's Wi-Fi coverage, basically. Other sorts of things that you can do with these types of devices, well, um, this is a uh, keyboard, and basically the iPad is the engine. So the software lives on the iPad, it's touch screen, uh, and the keyboard is just your physical you know, interface to it. Um, so being a keyboard player myself, um, you know, I paid $5,000 for my keyboard uh, 15 years ago. And to upgrade that, I'm going to get nothing for it. So to upgrade my keyboard is going to cost me another $5,000. Whereas I can buy this controller here for $500. I've already got an iPad, put a $5 app on it, and it sounds as good as or better than a $5,000 keyboard. Uh, microphones, so you can plug in external microphones, get better sound quality than the built-in mic. You can plug your guitar into your iPhone, so instead of lugging around as a musician, you know, a whole raft of, um, uh, you know, various effects pedals, uh, you can have them all as apps on your, on your iPhone even, or on your iPad if you want it bigger, and you can now buy a Bluetooth um, selector, um, select and, um, button if you want to you know, use your feet to change the sounds rather than having to pull out your iPhone and touch the screen. Um, mixing desks, well when I was teaching audio engineering, digital mixing desks were relatively new and hugely expensive, $20,000 or so for a decent one. Uh, here again the price is way way down because the, all the engine and the interface is on the iPad, you plug your iPad in and the dials are just the interface and so the price of that the entry level into a digital mixer is, is reduced hugely. 
and you can even use it to simulate instruments. So here's my favorite app, which is called Futalele. You might want to download it if you've got an iPad. Uh, it is a paid app, I think. Um, it's not, not huge, probably $5. Um, but you can basically play a virtual ukulele. I have tried it over, over AirPlay, and there's a bit of a delay, so that's what I'm not, not going to do it live. Uh, and in this case, what they do is they sell you this little plastic um, inset, so you can put your iPad in the end of it and your iPhone in the, in the top, and via Bluetooth it synchronizes, so you use the, the iPhone to, to change chords, and then you strum on the iPad. Or if you, you can't afford that, you just use the iPad and it brings up a little keyboard on the iPad. So I've, I've learnt, learned how to um, play the ukulele so I can teach my grandson. Um, because I play acoustic guitar, but his fingers are too small for the guitar. The ukulele is a bit more user-friendly. But I must say he's better on the Futalele app than the real ukulele. Uh, other things you can do. Well, with the screen mirroring type of technology, uh, games can be enhanced. Uh, I know you've got a serious games unit here. I'm not quite sure what they what they do as far as their apps go. But instead of it just mirroring, uh, you can have different stuff on your small screen as to what you have on the big screen. So the big screen is basically the the immersive environment. The small uh, and the small screen is your controls. So it's like you're instead of, instead of having to have the thumb controller, you've got a touch screen controller. Huge for for a whole range of apps. It's just developers are a little bit slow in and sort of realizing that potential. Uh, some of the other things that we do, so moving beyond music now, just because that was my background, uh, we can use these tools to connect. So this is an example of a Hangout, a Google Plus Hangout. And uh, you might recognize one of the people there. Uh, she's looking a little bit thinner there than she currently is. That's, that's <laughs> Helen Keegan, uh, who's been working with the DML. And uh, we actually worked with Helen probably from about 2010. Uh, and I met her at the end of 2011. So we actually worked together for over a year before we actually met physically. We met over Google Plus Hangouts and Skype uh, virtually before we actually physically met. So being able to connect across the world is huge. So these people from all around the world, um, Max in Germany, uh, Dan in New Zealand, and this is his class here. And in fact, um, this, is, this is me here. And I've just got the camera facing out the window of the train because the time uh, of day when this hangout was, I was actually on my way into work on the train. And so I could connect uh, on my iPhone and still participate. I felt like a bit of a muppet, so I didn't actually say anything. I so I didn't look like I was talking to myself on the, on the, uh, on the train, but uh, I was able to listen in. And uh, this is another thing we can do with, with uh, mobile devices, which you, know, you can do on a lot of things now, is you know, create panoramas. So this is... Finland, and uh, it's just a square in Finland, and of course I was taking this nice panorama, and then the lecturer that I was working with, who, who was there, obviously managed to get himself as a selfie in the in the panorama. So as far as photography goes, the huge smartphones and what you can do with as far as photography goes, I'm sure you know a lot about that with uh, what Jonathan Wirth has done. Uh, this is an example of students using wireless present presentation to present uh, a project. So uh, one of the first times that we got our students to do this, set up an Apple TV, uh, and the, the our wireless network at this point didn't actually support airplane mirroring. So what they actually did, as you can see, they've got their iPhone there, and they turned their iPhone into a hotspot and used that to uh, wirelessly connect and use their own data. Now we've basically worked with our IT department to, s to open up airplane mirroring right across our whole network which might be something you need to do here too. Uh, and with AirPlay mirroring, we can have multiple devices. So uh, here's me and a few lecturers exploring uh, us all connecting at the same time. So as far as learning what you can do with mobile devices in different contexts, uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all. And so what we try to do is actually create communities of practice. And uh, this is one of the the projects they had in around 2009 with product design students and lecturers. And we just get together each week, explore ideas, what could we do that was appropriate to that context, rather than, you know, here's a cool app, let's just muck around with it. It's more like, well, what's appropriate and what can we do in that context to, you know, communicate with other product designers, to be able to share students' work, uh, to be able to showcase their work, put it online, etc., etc. et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, and this is my, uh, my boss here, 
Stanley. I don't know if anyone knows Stanley. And uh, Laurent f features in a lot of my videos, uh, um, snapshots. He's French, uh, but he has been in New Zealand for about 10 years. Uh, he's a graphic design lecturer, uh, but really into um, trying new things and new ideas, and so we do a lot of projects together. Journalism. Um, this is my second office, which is a coffee bar called Remedy Cafe. It's uh, about a five minute walk down from my office. And it has really good coffee and it has free Wi-Fi. And all the lecturers that I work with, I give them iPads or iPhones if they don't have them. Uh, and so we can meet anywhere. So we get out of the, out of the office, we go down to coffee, we have a um, coffee bar, have good coffee, sit around the table, brainstorm ideas, and actually use the devices in a real world context which is really important. And from that experience, hopefully they can start um, thinking about how they can bring that back into their teaching and into their class. So for me, community practice is, is, is uh, a powerful tool for bringing about change. You can see um, this is a bit of a setup for a, for a magazine that we did. Uh, the three journalism lecturers there, we've worked with each other for a few years now. Um, but going beyond workshops, which really are an introductory type of a process, it's a, it's a good way to identify ideas, but you know, a, a one or two hour workshop is not gonna change your life. So um, what we try to do is actually work with people for at least six months, maybe a year. Some of these projects we've been working uh, together for over four years. And over that period of time, you can see you know, a big difference in practice and, and what they're doing with their students. Uh, and you know, just, just uh, another group of us sitting around at the coffee, uh, all working on our mobile devices. <coughs> this is perhaps an example of not thinking so differently uh, with an iPad. Uh, as you can see, what's been done is it's been bolted to the desk, which I'm not quite sure why you would do with a mobile device, uh, but obviously they were afraid of someone stealing it. Um, but, you know, at some stage you've got to, you know, have a bit of trust. Uh, and if... You know, stealing an iPad is an issue. Maybe uh, students should own their own rather than you having one for a class. So not, not thinking differently. Uh, and what can we do with them? Well, just like I'm doing here, you can actually present from them. It allows you to move around and interact, etc. Uh, this is a bit of an earlier photo. This is one of my nephews. And uh, this is an iPod Touch. Uh, he was about eight or nine at this stage. And basically all I had to do was give him him give him the iPod Touch and he was away. You know, it was just intuitive. The, the touch interface is intuitive for kids. They don't even conceptualise it as a computer. So he's now in high school, he's got himself a, a MacBook Air, etc. And, and so basically the, the, the computing and digital world is just part of his life. Uh, this is one of my nieces on the train uh, using the iPad. This is my grandson and uh, He's, uh, he's sort of emulating uh, playing on the piano. He can't really play the piano yet, but uh, he likes banging the keys. And uh, here he is, two, two years old. His name's Seth. But as far as his world goes, you know, uh, an iPad is, is just part of his world. It's always been there. So the first thing he asks for is when, when we turn up is Gramps' iPad. You know, he wants the iPad and he wants to have a play. And we let him have a play for 10 minutes and then he has to go and do something else or else he gets grumpy. Uh, and so he has a folder, a folder of his own apps on the iPad. They're all interactive type apps, so he's playing like the, the Lego train and he's making the train go round and round and do things, racing apps. His favourite things at the moment, because he's almost four now, so this is when he was two. Uh, he loves more sort of uh, animal type uh, apps and listening to different types of birds, sort of more uh, sort of National Geographic type stuff, where he's actually discovering things. Uh, and there he is, so he jumps into bed with us and uses the iPad, as long as he's good. <coughs> so other things that we do, um, well we have lattes, uh, you know, I know you have lattes here and you know, Costa and Nero, but what, what's a latte? Oh, you've all gone to sleep. <laughs> well, coffee. yeah, yeah, beyond coffee, um, we're, they're learning and teaching technology enablers for us. So uh, we like coffee, so that's why we have a few sort of coffee memes. Um, but we have these students, basically, who work part-time for our centre, uh, sort of, you know, one or two days a week, and they first put a call with our lecturers. So setting up your email on your iPad or your iPhone or your Android tablet or 
all those sorts of things, um, they, they get involved in that. And it's quite a, a nice process because there's no power relationship there. Uh, it's, not, it's not like they're, they're thinking that they're going to look silly in front of another more experienced lecturer. It's just uh, you know, a lecturer working with a student. And it means that uh, myself and my other colleagues don't get bogged down with you know, endlessly showing people how to set up their email on their iPad, etc. The other thing they've done is they've, they've created a whole range of e-books on how to do stuff on the iPad, iPhone in particular, uh, but it's also available for Android. Things like how to use research materials like Mendeley or Zotero on your mobile device. Um, and they've got a whole range of those, those um, iBooks. So there you can see um, one of our lattes. And basically they form their own team. They, they work together and they organise themselves and they use Google Docs and Google Spreadsheets to organise their time. So one of the keys for me with mobile learning is, is just a very basic framework, the CMR framework. You've probably heard about it from uh, Pontadura, uh, who's an American. Uh, Apple uh, roll him out quite often to the events. They seem to like his, his framework. Um, but it's a very simple sort of rule of thumb fam framework as, as far as conceptualizing what you can do with, in, in this case, we we're applying it to mobile devices. Um, it's about any educational technology, so moving from substitution towards hopefully redefinition. So the idea is, initially most people start with, well, I've got an iPad, um, great, I can put my PowerPoint on there. Or, you know, I can do my email, or I can, you know, write a Word document or read a Word document. Basically, you're substituting a process. You're doing something you can already do on a desktop or a laptop. So there's nothing, nothing revolutionary there, apart from perhaps it's a bit more portable, you can do that on the train. Um, but effectively you're substituting a process. Augmentation is where you're starting to improve that process, so maybe you can annotate PDFs on your, your iPad. Uh, instead of using PowerPoint, you could use Prezi or you know, something slightly more high-end type presentation software. Once you get above that into to modification, you start being able to start thinking a bit more creatively of what can I do. So most people start at that productivity level and then move on to, hey, how can we actually start thinking differently? How can we start doing things that we couldn't do before? Or not easily. So being able to do stuff that before mean a whole you know, big setup, um, and now we can just do with our mobile phone. A whole lot cheaper. So modification, redefinition, about doing things that before were conceptually or practically impossible to do. Um, so we've run a quite a few courses and, and uh, projects on mobile filmmaking, and students do things like uh, tie little um, uh, parachutes onto their iPhones and throw them out the window and, and you can record it going down. You wouldn't do that with a DLSLR or you know, a, you know, a red cam or anything because it's so much more expensive and a whole lot heavier, so you'd need a much bigger parachute. Uh, or they put them inside plastic bags and go in the swimming pools and, and record uh, you know, stuff underwater. Um, they tie them on the end of sticks and run with them. So, uh, so instead of having to have set up um, train tracks and have cranes and or have a drone uh, for to, for capturing action, you can just tape your iPhone onto the end of your stick. Some of them have, have um, taped them onto their feet, you know, so they can actually get an experience of what it looks like when you're walking, etc. Doing stuff that before was either really expensive or impossible. Uh, and I quite like this uh, this um, dual bit. Uh, cartoon about PowerPoint. I think PowerPoint really is to blame for a lot of um, basically where we're stuck with as far as education goes. Um, I know some people use PowerPoint very creatively, but not many people. So uh, basically I, I refuse to use PowerPoint and try to use other tools, which I'm trying to demo to you, but nothing too exciting so far. Uh, and I guess as far as time goes, how can we sort of conceptualise moving forward? Well, unfortunately, most of education is, is really stuck back in the last century. If you really look at it, uh, we're very much a web one approach, um, which is teacher-centred, using the, the, the learning management system. It's about content delivery. Uh, you know, it's about access to knowledge and guarding that access. Uh, and PowerPoint is one way we do that because we don't let our students have the PowerPoint until after the lecture to make sure they come to the lecture. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, because we gave it to them beforehand, they might not come. Um, 
Uh, well, yes, but that's, that's just, just to illustrate perhaps there should be some change. Uh, and perhaps there's not. Um, so I, I, I do tend to upset people sometimes when I talk, talk about this, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to get people to think differently, think a little bit differently. So, you know, we come to 2005 and uh, we've got Web2, so social media. It's actually uh, 10 years old. Uh, I, I don't know, you're probably some of the cutting edge people here, so you're probably using social media, but uh, I don't see a whole lot of it in general in education, still 10 years on. Um, so suddenly we can do stuff that's a lot more student-centred, perhaps based on e-portfolios, uh, about student creating their content and sharing it, uh, generate student-generated content, perhaps a, a modification of processes moving from PowerPoint to SlideShare, where you upload your PowerPoint, it's shared online, students can actually uh, access the link beforehand or during class and go back and forwards between slides. So I've given you access to my, to my actual folder of slides here, so that if you got bored with my presentation or you missed something, you can go back to it and flick for it yourself. Um, so we're starting to be a bit more student-centred in our pedagogy, which is andragogy, social learning, about community building. And then, of course, as I talked about before, with the advent of mobile connectivity, 2013, really, um, we've got the possibility to do this sort of stuff now. So it's about being mobile. We could be actually outside of the classroom and do stuff. In fact, we could do something that's much more authentic than being stuck in, in, uh, and disconnected between theory and practice. Uh, look at uh, collaboration. Effectively, your mobile phone is a collaborative tool. We, you, know, you ring people on it all the time. How can you use that in an educational context? You know, maybe they, they ring up an expert and do an interview on their phone or something, or Skype or Hangout. Um, Social media and mobile blended together. So you know, basically all the social media platforms are now mobile friendly. There's going to be an app for just about everything. Uh, if not, there's an HTML5 version of that site, which is friendly across all platforms. So we're not just talking about iPads and iPhones here. We try to talk about tools that are device agnostic. So we, we choose um, social media and platforms that work on all devices or as many as possible. Uh, if you've got a Windows device, you may be a little bit sort of excluded from some of the cool stuff. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's life with uh, Windows. Uh, but certainly Android and, and, and iOS, uh, there's going to be an app for, for everything, effectively. Some of the really, really cool in-depth stuff, like some of the music stuff, there isn't, just because you can't code to that level with, an, with Android, or at least not um, effectively across multiple devices. With the iPhone or iPad, you've only got one device to code for, and you can make it work. So looking at uh, Hudagogy, um, I don't know if you've heard of Hudagogy, but it's about student-directed learning, about the student actually coming up with ideas and projects and defining those projects and, and uh, being a whole lot more involved in the learning process, being more active. Um, and this is a table, and there's too much stuff there to, to read on the slide, but you can look at the link yourself. So what we try to do is really map what we do as far as the SAMR framework goes, which is moving from substitution to to redefinition with the idea of different pedagogies moving from a teacher-directed pedagogy to a student-directed uh, or student-centred pedagogy and how those line up. And how that, what that means as far as the course go, about the location of, of the control, about the cognitive environment, how that lines up with creativity. So a lot of the stuff I do is in creative arts, because that's my background. Uh, it's a little bit harder to, to conceptualise and some of the more knowledge disciplines, but it is possible. It's, it's just really thinking differently about that. So uh, I guess trying to strike a balance between um, uh, theory and practice and, and cool stuff in a presentation is quite hard, but this is another link to basically what we call our mobile social media framework, uh, which if you wanted to scan that, uh, it's, it's another whole Evernote note which just goes through um, some of our research that, that you can read if you're into reading really boring journal articles, etc. So we have got quite a lot of research based around what we've been doing. It's not just having fun and playing. So there's, there's three kind of key elements that we've sort of discovered over doing a whole range of projects in different contexts. So uh, one of them is, is really modelling the use of these devices. Uh, so uh, you as a lecturer, if you say to your students, OK, I want you to come up with a project uh, using your mobile phone, um, but you never model that process yourself, you're, you're implying to the student that what you're trying to get them to do is not actually that important. 
um, or you know, because you're not showing them. And in fact, students don't know how to do a lot of the stuff. All they need, all they need, know how to do is Facebook, text messaging, take photos, uh, Instagram, uh, and um, Snapchat. And that, that's about it. And uh, we'll show you some uh, some results of student surveys if we get time soon to prove that. But effectively, over the last seven years, that profile hasn't really changed. There's few new different tools like Facebook's really taken off and obviously Snapchat um, but really what students do is not a whole lot of creative stuff with their devices. So actually doing some stuff, figuring out how to do some creative stuff on your device uh, is going to actually put you ahead of where your students are at. So the whole digital native thing is, is a crock. It's a load of rubbish. They're, they're, you know, what they, their, their knowledge of how to do stuff is very, very limited. And the way to find that out is just to ask them. So uh, do a survey. Uh, redefining pedagogy. So not trying to do what you're already doing. You know, take the opportunity to actually be a bit more creative in, in the way that you interact uh, and, and thinking through. Um, do you really need that exam? Um, so when I was teaching audio engineering, I guess I got to the point where I got tired of students coming to me the day before the exam and wanting to know all the answers to the exam. I thought, well, this is just pointless. You know, all they're doing is regurgitating you know, the exam. Uh, and so I got rid of all exams and, and everything became project based. So instead of them doing an exam about how to design a loudspeaker, I wanted them to design a loudspeaker and that was their project, uh, etc. So trying to rethink pedagogy. Uh, and also having the uh, infrastructure to support this. Obviously if you're going to get people to interact with wireless technology, the, the uh, you know, Wi-Fi needs to be able to handle that. And we've had to jump through a couple of hoops to get this working here. Uh, this is Gary Larson, anyone Gary Larson fan, uh, fan? Yeah, comics, yeah. So he's got here cow tools, and of course cows are a big theme for him. Uh, which, uh, you know, if you've been to New Zealand, cows are, you know, we've probably got more cows than people. Um, and definitely more, well actually, I think we've got more cows now than we used to have sheep. Um, our dairy industry is our biggest export. And of course, uh, once China starts having their own dairy farms, then uh, we're starting to lose a lot of income. But anyway, um, a, a, a university in Australia uh, designed what they call cows, which is computers on wheels. So it's a big screen TV like this one, except it's on wheels. So instead of it being locked to one position, you can move around. All you need is power. And on the back of it is a computer, and that drives the software to, to uh, interact with mobile devices and allow students to screen mirror from their device uh, they can use the computer that's there via a Bluetooth keyboard, etc., to work in groups and teams and come up with projects and share them. Um, we wanted to sort of come up with something like that for our own context, but we wanted to modify it for a New Zealand context, so we called ours mowers. And this is the last recorded so sighting of a mower. Um, I was about to uh, get a tramper there. Actually, no, mowers died out several hundred years ago. But this is from an ad for Air New Zealand and what they have actually is Bear Grylls being chased by a mower. Um, so uh, we tried to des redesign this idea of cows uh, for mowers, which our acronym is Mobile Airplay Screens. So it sort of squeezed that into mower. But, uh, so not having a, a computer on the, on the screen, the computer is your smartphone or your, your tablet. Why do you need another computer? It's just a waste. You've already got a computer. All you need to do is to make the screen bigger because the limitation is the size of the screen. So we went through a sort of a design thinking process on how to develop these and uh, came up with our own design. We got a product design student who had just, um, just finished his course. Um, you can buy them, of course, um, but they're thousands of dollars. So our key point was every item had to be less than $1,000 because that's our CapEx limit. So anything beyond that, we've got to go into the huge process of getting it into our budget for the year which is, as you know, a pain in the ass. So if we can get each item, each individual item under $1,000, then we could do this just out of our you know, normal budget. Uh, and the stands, the commercial stands, which are all metal and really clunky and heavy and ugly, cost 1500 bucks. So there's no way we could do that. So we designed our own in, in partnership with a student. He used laminated plywood. Uh, and it actually looks and feels so much nicer than the, the commercial metal ones. Um, so we end up with a flock of mowers. So this is our flock of mowers, and uh, this is like version two, and it's gone, been through another couple of iterations since then. Um, basically, every time we build some, there's a, there's a new TV. Uh, TVs are like mobile devices. In fact, they probably go out of, uh, out of stock quicker. So we started with plasmas. 
Uh, we can't even buy our plasma anymore. E everything's LED, so uh, which is which is better. But when we started, we couldn't afford LEDs. Just to show, prove that they are mobile. There you go. Uh, and the key thing with these actually is the wheels. Um, if you're going and take them across the street, you've got to have good wheels. Uh, our first version, which we call the Proto Mower, I haven't got a photo of it here, uh, but it didn't have very good wheels on. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, our HOD was taking our Proto Mower down the street, and one of the wheels fell off. Um, so he had to do a bit of repair. One of the other keys of, uh, of what, what we've been doing is coming up with some critical success factors. And we've got a local artist called Tin Man, or Tin Man is sort of his meme, and he's got six sort of critical success factors here. And this is just a bit of fun. That's kind of one of my favourite ones. But uh, um, but the real ones are actually published in, in BJET. So this is uh, the, the uh, early online version of BJET, but it's actually in, in print now. Um, and this is a bad slide, but it just gives you the critical success factors that we come up with, which sort of you know, inform our framework. So really, if you're going to do something innovative in the teaching and learning process, you need to integrate it into the assessment, into the course. If it's just an add-on, then why would the students do it? Uh, apart from hopefully they find it a lot of fun, engaging, but if there's nothing that they get out of it, then what's the point? Um, yeah, so uh, you know, students are driven by assessment. So if you're going to do something new and innovative, you need to think how you're going to assess that. How it's going to become part of the assessment process? What are you going to drop and, uh, and bring in instead? You know, maybe you drop that exam or you, you drop the, uh, um, you know, the essay or, or, or whatever and you replace that with the, the project using mobile devices or whatever it is. Modelling it, just like we've talked about, uh, creating a supportive learning community, so an environment where people feel safe and trying new stuff. Um, they don't, you know, you don't um, make them feel silly if they don't know how to do something, which, is, is, uh, as I've said, most of the students actually don't know how to do a lot of this sort of thing. Um, the appropriate choice of, of tools and of software, so not just choosing the latest cool thing to, to play with, but what's appropriate. Um, some of the earliest projects that I did was with Palm PDAs, as I said. So I learned how to use the Palm OS, and uh, when the, uh, the Palm Trio, the integrated phone in Palm PDA came out, sort of 2006 or so, I thought, wow, cool, let's use that, and let's get all our students to buy those, and, and we'll have this fantastic project. They absolutely hated them, because it was such a clunky, blooming phone, and the camera on it was absolutely rubbish. It's like a 640. Um, you know, pixel uh, camera, and so they said, no, we don't want to use that, we want to use a Nokia phone, which has much better camera, and, and it's cool because it's got the, you know, flip-out keyboard, etc. and so we went to Nokia's. Of course, it's a pretty iPhone. So you sort of learn from your mistakes. Um, it's not really about just what, what do you think is, the, is, you know, the coolest technology to use, it's about what's appropriate. So... You know, think, think about what is appropriate to your, your context. Um, having technical and pedagogical support, I guess that's my role in most of the projects. Um, having you know, the, the teaching learning uh, background and, uh, and the technology there to be able to support people in, in doing stuff. And having a sustained interaction, so that's why workshops for me don't work. It's, it's about you know, working alongside people, mentoring them, um, being in class with them the first time they try something, so if it, if it falls over, you know, I can troubleshoot it for them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, that's what the, I presume the DML team is here for as well. Uh, so as far as, uh, as research and, and you know, whenever you're doing stuff with technology, there seems to be a disconnect between uh, the theory and the practice. And often uh, people do really cool things, but they don't actually research it. Uh, they don't write it up. There's no real sort of research background or, or real rigorous critique behind what they're doing. So what we try to do is really have a research methodology in behind what we're doing and build into all of our projects um, the scholarship of technology-enhanced learning, which is really bringing in the scholarship of, of teaching and learning into the 21st century. Um, so you've, you might have heard of Boyer, who came up with the idea of, of SOTL or scholarship of te teaching and learning, which is trying to sort of say to people that... Uh, Reflective practice and research on that practice is valid research output. And you can not only get research output, but become a better teacher. Um, while updating that for 
edu uh, educational technology. That's, that's basically what SOTL is. So uh, using an educational design research framework or design-based research, it depends you know, what you want to call it, same thing, uh, which is effectively sort of like, a, like an, a, an iterative process. So being informed by, by research, by, in this case, uh, over all the projects we've done, our social media framework, so we've come up with that sort of guidelines of how to do stuff, so that informs our curriculum design. Um, recently, we've really tried to sort of use uh, rhizomatic learning as a bit of a framework, which is sort of decentralised, uh, so it's more student-focused, student projects, and your role is not one of content deliverer or, you know, the gatekeeper of content, but, but one of designing the experiences for your students. So it's quite a different approach. And your, your role becomes designing triggering events to get them thinking, to think, you know, help hopefully get them to think differently. So that's practice. And then finally, the critical reflection is writing up those experiences, uh, you know, at the end of the project, getting feedback from your students, evaluation, etc. Uh, other things that we've done is form uh, global community practice, and this is one that uh, ran for about four years. And uh, once again, you can see uh, Helen there. This is before she joined DML uh, from Salford. She's still part time at Salford. So um, I first met Helen online in 2010, looking at uh, at the Alt Conference and just reading about what she'd been up to. Put a comment on her blog. Thought, hey, we're doing some uh, mobile filmmaking stuff here in New Zealand. How about we collaborate? And that just started a conversation. Uh, and then we got Helen as an external global expert to you know, Skype into our class of mobile filmmaking. She showed some of what her, she'd been doing. Uh, she fed back to our students on their projects. They uploaded their projects to YouTube. She gave them a critique. And they thought it was fantastic. And so we just got her involved in our projects. Uh, so here we've got um, Catherine Cronin from Ireland. Got Ma from... Um, uh, Barcelona, well, Tarragona, um, Spain, but she'd shoot me if I said Spain, it's Catalonia. Uh, got Sarah from Australia, uh, Bernie from Ireland, um, Alona from uh, Berlin, and uh, Avril and myself from New Zealand. And this tends to fluctuate, different people get involved, they've got different you know, uh, constraints on their time, and it's gone for a diff different uh, sort of iteration. So we call that iColab. And this is just a Google map showing you where everyone is from. And we're using these tools to communicate. So Twitter is huge for us to be able to communicate across time zones. Because um, Helen's always in bed when I'm awake and vice versa, although she does tend to stay up most of the night. Uh, but some of the other lecturers aren't. So being able to communicate asynchronously is, is um, quite important. And as this has developed, um, uh, it's gone through a bit of a process. So originally it was a community practice of lecturers from different countries. And then what we did was effectively brokered that idea to our students. So it was different student groups uh, that we're all teaching. Um, in my case, uh, I'm an academic advisor, so I'm working as alongside other lecturers. And that effectively created this global community. And via research output, uh, hopefully we've sort of brokered that into the wider global community. And and now, really, it's become more of a network. So we actually get each other involved in our classes remotely. Uh, they, they we speak into each other's classes via Skype or hang Google Hangouts or upload YouTube videos for tutorials, etc. So now we leverage each other's exp experience in our different projects. Uh, this is one project that Laurent myso and myself uh, uh, undertook, which is uh, reinventing a graphics design course to focus on rather than pen and paper on our students creating a digital profile and looking at Behance as an online uh, e-portfolio. Uh, Behance is now owned by Adobe. So anyone who's into graphics design should probably be on Behance because the biggest graphic design company in the world now owns Behance and integrates that into all their products now. So the Creative Cloud is just a one button press to stick something straight out of uh, Photoshop or InDesign straight to your Behance um, profile and, and share that with this online community where there's actually a lot of critique going on on people's work. And so we got students to set up their Behance profiles. We gave them a, a core set of tools. So these were our triggering events, I suppose, uh, our ecology of resources as far as rhizomatic learning goes. Uh, and that's what we got them to sort of work off. Um, so as far as text goes, we got them using Twitter, Storify, 
Uh, as far as community goes, we've got them using a Google Plus community, sort of as a course hub instead of the LMS, a bit more open. Um, it means that getting, bringing people in like Helen and Alona and stuff to speak into a class, we didn't have to give them passwords into Blackboard and you know, jump through huge hoops to get that happening. Um, their profile, sort of using Behance and Instagram with video, we, we, we uh, got them to use Vine and because the graphics design students, Vine's only six seconds of video, but the really cool Vines are basically animations. A six second video is pretty boring, even if it's six seconds. But if it's an an animation, you can do some really powerful stuff. And so we got students to actually create a basically a commercial of their own product, of their own skills using Vine, and they had to do that in six seconds. And so there's a lot of animation. Uh, YouTube, Vimeo, Viclone is collaborative video. And they had to document this process in a WordPress blog, which is, for most of them, uh, the first time they've done it. Uh, we have a national project as well, uh, which is funded by uh, an organisation in New Zealand called Akawaya Te Rau. It involves six institutions across the country. And uh, that just gives you a, a snapshot of them. There's three politics and three universities, and we're all exploring uh, the impact of mobile devices with various contexts for learners and, and obviously for the lecturers as well. Uh, and this just gives you a bit of an idea of where those are. Uh, across New Zealand, uh, there's the New Zealand map. We have two islands, the North Island, which is probably a lot more like the UK than, than the South Island. The South Island, we have uh, a series of Alps, goes right through the centre, uh, huge Alpine range, and then it goes out to sea out through the middle of the North Island. Um, so it's you know probably a bit more like Switzerland as far as the environment goes. Really nice lakes, great place for tramping, etc. So we've got uh, Polytech right down the bottom, got a couple in the middle and then a couple at the top. Finally, um, one of the projects that I'm really excited about at the moment is really trying to take this idea of communities of practice to, uh, to upscale it beyond the, the physical communities of practice and looking at the idea of CMOOC to be able to do that. So CMOOC is a connectivist MOOC, which is really about connecting people. It's not about content delivery, which is your X MOOC, you know, your Coursera, your edX, et cetera, which is just another way of delivering content. You pay your fees, you get the content, pass the exam, you get your certificate. With a CMOOC, it's about the interaction. It's about the community. It's about building bridges. And once again, about as far as the design of it goes, creating triggering events to get people thinking and, and collaborating. So in this context, we developed uh, uh, an ecology of resources, which is based around Google Plus for the community, um, Twitter for communication, and using hashtags. So if you want to uh, be involved in this at all, our hashtag is Mossamelt, hash Mossamelt for mobile social media uh, learning technologies. And uh, if you, you know, uh, want to tweet anything and, and become part of this, uh, CMOOC or part of the project to follow it, just, just use that hashtag. Um, and we also use that hashtag for all other social media as well, so YouTube videos, Vine videos, etc. That gets put into the, into the uh, title of the, the content. Uh, sh people, participants create their own blogs. We have a WordPress site hosted, set up for people to sign up because stuff that we can't do on WordPress.com. And then we have a WordPress.com basically with our triggering events just so it's as open as possible. So that's, um, that was supposed to be the intro. <laughs> uh, but um, we've pr pretty much used up our time. So I guess what I wanted to sort of segue into was um, what I'm here for the next two weeks is to um, be available to work with anyone who's interested in anything that I've sort of talked about, anything to do with mobile learning, augmented reality, virtual reality. Um, obviously my expertise is around mobile. So as far as um, virtual reality goes, it's like Google Cardboard, uh, augmented reality, there's various uh, augmented reality browsers, uh, and we get students to create the content for them. So rather than turning your course into an augmented reality experience, it's about creating projects for students to, to create. That's sort of the focus. And the other thing I'd be really keen for is to get people involved in this Mossamelt CMOOC. If you uh, want to be involved in in a process that, that's between six months and 12 months long and explore, hopefully in a supportive environment, uh, um, then, then join us with Mossamelt. And you can do that from anywhere. Um, we've just going, almost finished the first iteration of it this year. So we've done it in two halves. Let me just bring it up on um, WordPress for you. And 
and uh, I've got another di uh, um, disruptive bytes presentation, so we'll do the rest of it then, or part of it. <laughs> uh, here we go. So this is the WordPress site. If you want to have a look, mossamelt.wordpress.com. And uh, we've broken up into two halves. The first half is effectively half a year or one, one university semester uh, exploring. So the first six weeks is just getting set up with some of the basic communication collaboration tools. The second six weeks is looking at some of the things that you can do that, that are unique to mobile devices and, and the types of social media that you can leverage. Uh, so that by the end of that six months, you've got the experience to actually start applying this to your teaching context. The second half, which we're currently sort of halfway through, is then using that to build a portfolio for CMOLD accreditation. So uh, CMOLD is a certified member of the Association for Learning Technologies, uh, which is basically a parallel path to the HEA uh, Academy, which uh, it, it's a portfolio-based um, process to accredit you that you know what you're doing with teaching and learning as far as e educational technology goes. And you can put that on your profile. Hopefully it goes towards your progression, et cetera, et cetera. So what we didn't want to do with, with, um, with Moss Melt was create a course. Uh, we didn't want to do that. We didn't want it to be about content. We wanted it to be about experiences and people collaborating. And probably what I'd do for the next iteration is I'd change it from calling them weeks to probably activities and let people take their own pace rather than making it a weekly thing. Um, so we're learning as we go as well, but um, we didn't want to have to go through the whole process of getting a, creating a course and then getting that accredited, because that can take like two years. Uh, it took us six weeks to design the, the Moss and Melt uh, CMOOC and start delivering it, because we use an external accrediting environment, which is CMOT. And all we're doing is giving people a pathway into that. Um, so CMOT accreditation has nothing to do with me, um, it's just a way of you getting recognition for what you're learning. So keen to get people involved in that. If anyone's interested, you know, join us with, uh, with Moss and Melt. I'm around for the next two weeks. Keen to just talk to people, brainstorm ideas, build some partnerships. Uh, you know, just happy to help in whatever way I can. So I'll be based here in the uh, DML.